I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wiradjuri uh, people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay respect to elders past, present and future, for they hold the memories, culture, tradition and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that contribute to our community. I'm Anne-Marie, I'm the Festival Director and I am thrilled to welcome you to this event. And uh, probably everyone knows by now, in case you missed the memo and you're wondering why there's not three people on stage, Scott Ludlam, of course, wasn't able to attend, uh, which means we have all that time on Jeff. Got more of Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> which I think will be fantastic. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce our host for tonight, Dr. Eve Rees. I haven't got my glasses and I haven't got any light, so this is great. <laughs> I can sit up here with you. Um, so, Eve Rees is an award winning writer and historian. They currently lecture in history at La Trobe University and are co host of the fantastic podcast Archive Fever with Claire Wright. Uh, Eve has a regular history segment on ABC Radio Melbourne and their writing has featured in the Sydney Review of Books, The Age, Archer Magazine, lots of fabulous publications and probably more. Yeah, you don't need to use what printed on. Uh, Eve was the recipient of the 2020 Calibre Essay Prize for their essay, Reading the Mess Backwards, which forms part of Eve's memoir, All About Eve, uh, which you can come back on Sunday and hear all about. And Eve also co-edited the anthology Nothing to Hide, Australia's first mainstream anthology of trans and gender diverse writing, which just launched this week. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but of course, this event's not all about Eve. I'm gonna, <laughs> hand, <laughs> I'm gonna hand over to you to introduce Jeff and your conversation together. Um, and so can we please just make them very welcome. Thanks, Anne-Marie, for that very warm welcome. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Eve, and it's a real pleasure to be here on Wiradjuri country. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're on stolen land and to pay my respects to elders past and present. And just note that it's a real honour to be here at a writers' festival talking about books and storytelling on the lands of, uh, you know, the world's oldest storytellers. Uh, so we're here tonight not to talk all about Eve, but to talk about a world of possibility with Jeff Sparrow. So Jeff is, I think it's fair to say, uh, one of the most significant leftist thinkers in Australia today. He's a columnist for The Guardian Australia, the former editor of Overland Journal, and he teaches journalism at the University of Melbourne. He's also the author of an intimidatingly large number of books, including Fascists Among Us, Online Hate and the Christchurch Massacre, Trigger Warnings, Political Correctness and the Rise of the Right, and No Way But This, In Search of Paul Robeson. But his book, uh, which came out in 2021, which we're talking about this evening, is Crimes Against Nature, Capitalism and Global Heating. Now, even though I'm a historian, you know, by trade, not a, not a climate thinker or climate scientist, I have read a lot of books about the climate crisis, and this book is hands down one of the best things I've read on the topic. Um, it's composed of a series of really elegant essays that examine how capitalism and the destruction of nature go hand in hand. To have any hope of staving off environmental apocalypse, Jeff argues, we must end the economic system that demands the exploitation of humans and nature in the pursuit of endless growth. And what I really love about this book, because I'm a historian, is that Jeff makes his argument by delving into history, by looking at key moments in the development of industrial capitalism and consumer society. Jeff shows us how we ended up in this current mess but really importantly, reminds us that nothing about this moment is inevitable. 
this kind of current crisis that we're in was made by humans, so it can also be unmade by humans. And we are not destined as humans to destroy the earth. Um, it's a short book, but it covers a lot of ground, which we'll be talking about tonight. And while it's a sobering read, it's also um, a profoundly hopeful one. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Sparrow. That is such a generous introduction. I feel like I should just not say anything for the rest of the evening because everything I will say will be an anticlimax after that. <laughs> No, I don't <laughs> one, of, one of Jeff's many excellent traits is his modesty, but it is a truly excellent book. So just to kind of, um, you know, set the scene for people who aren't familiar with this book, you know, you've got a long history of writing about, I suppose, you know, leftist politics and capitalism, but this is sort of your first major piece of work on climate change. So what, what was the kind of intellectual genesis of this project? How did you kind of dive into it? I mean, I think the world changed more than I changed. No, the world changed and I changed. So I grew up at a time when if you were a left-wing activist, and particularly if you were on the socialist left as I was, you weren't necessarily particularly interested mm in the environment and you know like i mean i i i sort of came to adulthood in a kind of post-punk milieu which makes me sound absolutely ancient but it was kind of a you know we were very hostile to those that we saw as hippies who yeah. you know were concerned about you know hugging trees and all that what a waste of time yeah. what a, what a, <laughs> that, it, totally right so and it never seemed particularly um interesting or important to me i was much more focused on the city than i was on the country but of course climate change is now so much part of the political horizon that if you're at all interested in politics it is really the question that you have to engage with and, and i think it's increasingly apparent that climate change is not just an environmental issue in the old way we used to think about the environment, but it is a crisis intensifier. So almost every kind of oppression is exacerbated by climate change. Climate change overwhelmingly affects the poor and the oppressed, whether in a wealthy country like Australia, and you only have to think of the people affected by fires and floods, overwhelmingly people without very much money, and in the world as a whole, the poorer countries are more affected than the richer countries. Within the poorer countries, it is the poorest countries who are most affected. So, you know, think of a country like Pakistan, where now a third of that nation is underwater. Some 30 million people have been displaced by floods that are a direct result of climate change. They are now anticipating massive um, famine and the onset of uh, waterborne diseases. So horrendous suffering being inflicted on the poorest people who had the least to do with creating the, the carbon throughout the atmosphere. So, so for me, I guess, it, it was that sense that if you wanted to talk about the world today, if you wanted to talk about almost any political issue, you had to engage with the question of climate. And so I went back and I redid some basic theoretical reading. And of course, I came to the realisation that you cannot have a theory of social change, you cannot have a theory of political action without having an understanding of the relationship between humanity and nature. Now, that is an obvious point, but it never really occurred to me before. And I think, you know, part of what I try to do in this book is to say that we need to go back to those fundamental questions about how humans as a species relate to the natural world, how that has changed over the time, and what is happening in this particular society to make that relationship with nature so fundamentally toxic and dysfunctional. And I think, you know, a lot of us have had particular moments when we really, like, realise the gravity of the climate crisis, and it's not just a kind of an issue for tree-hugging hippies, it's an issue for all of us, the most burning issue of our time. You know, for a lot of us, it might have been, you know, the Black Summer of 2019, 2020. Um, did you have a particular moment where it really hit you? I mean, I was living in Sydney during um, 2019, and I was already thinking about climate change there, but just... <sighs> 
walking out into a city where the smoke was so thick that you could barely see the sun, where doctors were telling people that it was toxic to be outside, and realising that huge chunks of the population had no alternative but to go to work in conditions that doctors were describing as thoroughly carcinogenic, it made me really think about the way that the climate crisis is going to play out and who is mm. going to bear the cost of this crisis. Because it was, I mean, I'm sure everyone here had that same experience. If you had the money, you had a good air conditioning system, you worked inside, you had a dehumidifier or whatever, and you weren't very well, very, very much affected. If you didn't have those things, if you worked on a building site, you just breathed in carcinogenic um, fumes. And I actually was actually at, a, at, a, at um, an event at um, the Byron Bay Writers Festival, I know you were at as well, and um, someone there was telling me that um, doctors are now um, seeing all kinds of um, birth defects and, and um, and uh, illnesses in children because of the, the carcinogenic effects of that smoke that we all just breathe in in 2019. And it just became apparent, no one is going to stop this. If we don't stop it, no one is going to stop it. Yeah, and of course that same dynamic played out again with COVID where, you know, the privileged could afford to stay at home, get food delivered, but, you know, the precariously employed still had to go out and expose themselves to disease. So I'm going to um, ask Jeff now to read from the kind of opening page or so of his book, just so you can get a bit of a flavour of his argument and the quite elegant writing. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'll stop praising you. It's going to make you deeply will. uncomfortable. All right. Um, in a famous passage, the labour organiser and folk singer Utah Phillips identified our whole planet as a crime scene. The earth is not dying, he explained, it is being killed, and those who are killing it have names and addresses. He's right, but it's not at all what we're usually told. It's more common to hear that global heating stems from innate human greed, a vice for which we're all responsible. We buy the wrong things, we eat the wrong food, and we don't separate our trash. Our collective rapacity drives the deforestation, the pollution, and of course the emissions of greenhouse gases, as the industry groans and, gra groans and strains to keep us all satisfied. That's the customary accusation, the common sense narrative of climate change. But it's a frame up, a calumny leveled to help the real culprits of aid justice. In reality, from the very first adoption of fossil fuels to the ineffectual negotiations on emission levels, climate change has been driven not by the many, but by the few. A tiny coterie has used every weapon at its disposal to cajole, coerce and persuade the rest of us to accept practices we never wanted and that we often resisted. Whether we recycled or rode bicycles or turned off our lamps never made any difference to them. According to the most recent Oxfam's report, the 26 richest billionaires own as many assets as the 3.8 billion people comprising the poorest half of the planet's population. Yet despite the staggering inequalities of the current Gilded Age, we're still presented with narratives that flatten all responsibilities for the crisis. In these stories, we're all guilty, with global heating and the environmental crisis more generally almost the inevitable consequence of human progress, as if homo sapiens were a kind of virulent disease. To repeat, it's not true. There's another history, a true history, that doesn't defame ordinary people, one in which the villain isn't humanity per se, so much as a particular set of social and political structures that didn't exist in the past and needn't exist in the future. Thank you. It's nice to, um, it's nice to read that in a room surrounded by pictures of criminals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Onwards to the revolution. Uh, <laughs> join the criminals. Um, so that opening passage uh, introduces, you know, one of the core ideas of the book, which is essentially that we've all been sold a lie. Like we've all been told that it's up to individuals to um, fix the climate crisis. You know, that it's our fault for buying too much stuff, eating too much meat. Um, and if we only just bought a new keep cup, everything would be okay. Um, can you kind of flesh out this idea for us, this, your core argument that it's actually a lie that individuals bear the responsibility for causing the climate crisis and for fixing it? Yeah, I mean, this is something that really jumped out at me a few years ago when I did a bit for The Guardian on um, recycling. If you remember, there was a scandal a few years ago when it transpired that um, 
all of the rubbish that we all thought that we were recycling, that we just separated out our cans and our bottles or whatever, um, wasn't actually being used in any kind of useful way, but was being shipped over to China to be burnt in toxic dumps. And the Chinese decided that they weren't prepared to do this anymore, and the entire Australian recycling system broke down. And it made me so angry, right? Because this was the thing that we had all been told. Yeah. You've got to do this, you're doing your bit. And it was all just a lie. And they knew it was a lie. And that is a broader phenomenon, you know? Like, um, we're accustomed to one response to the climate crisis where the corporations engage in climate denialism, you know? And there's, there's still some people who do it, tabloid columnists who tell us that climate change isn't happening and stuff, but that stuff doesn't really wash anymore. Everyone can see the crisis unfolding all around us. So they have other strategies, and they have other strategies they've pioneered over a long, long time. And one of those core strategies is convincing ordinary people that it's their fault that it's not the fault of the corporations, it's not the fault of the economic system, it's not the fault of the politicians, it's your fault, you are doing all of these things and it's because of you that the corporations have to pollute. You know, you are greedy, you are lazy, and that's the reason why we have this environmental um, crisis. And of course, that is deeply paralyzing. Um, it forces people to um, beat themselves up and it leads to a deep alienation from any kind of politics. Because if you feel guilty, you're not likely to take very much um, in the way of political action. So in, in the book, I try to show over and over again the various strategies that the corporations deliberately use to um, induce this kind of political paralysis. So just one really quick um, example, the, the, the notion of a climate footprint, which was an idea that was very much um, popularised by Standard Oil in, uh, uh, in a, a major um, publicity campaign. Now, why would Standard Oil want people thinking about carbon footprints? Well, the idea of a carbon footprint is that we all have a certain amount of carbon for which we're individually responsible. So as soon as you start thinking like that, you put yourself on the same level as a corporation. You say, Esso has a carbon footprint, you have a carbon footprint. And so one of the corollaries of that is to say, how dare you criticise Esso when you haven't reduced your own carbon footprint? Change starts at home. What you really should be doing is trying to reduce your own carbon emissions. And of course, this is <laughs> even more dysfunctional because carbon emissions are baked into the economy as a whole. And so it's very, very difficult for individuals to meaningfully reduce their share of the economy. And there's a study by um, scholars at MIT that show that in America you can be homeless or you could be a Buddhist monk and it makes no appreciable difference to your carbon footprint. So this campaign is not only distracting people from the corporations that are overwhelmingly responsible for, 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 for this pollution. I mean, I think the figure is that at the moment is that um, the biggest fossil fuel companies have committed $900 billion to opening up more um, gas and oil fields by the year 2030. All right. So they're gambling against um, humanity. Thinking about your carbon footprint distracts you from the real culprits but it also makes you do something that's not going to work. Mm. So you end up beating yourself up for something that you cannot possibly change. And as a result of that, most people just think that there's nothing I can do about the environmental crisis. And they just lapse into a kind of sullen disconnection. And you see this over and over again. The people just do not want to read the news about the environmental crisis because it just makes them feel bad about themselves. And it's totally understandable, and I feel like that myself, right? But this is paralysing, and they know it's paralysing, and that's why they do it. Yeah, I certainly, I think, like many, you know, well-intentioned urban progressives went through that phase of trying to, you know, going vegan for environmental reasons, yeah, yeah. trying to stop flying, trying to stop using plastic, and it is. It's incredibly time-consuming and distracting, and... Um, a really effective tactic to stop people doing other forms of political change. 
But so I'm going to ask the kind of, you know, perhaps slightly glib question. It's a follow-up. Should we still recycle? Or is it... Yeah, I mean, I think that th th this is an interesting question, mm. and I think in some respects it goes to the difference between ethics and politics. Yeah. You know, like, um, I think it's a good thing to be an ethical person. It's a good thing to live an ethical life. It's a good thing to do things that you know are good in and of themselves, irrespective of their political consequence. It's a mistake, however, to treat ethics as politics. Mm. So that's a category. Yeah, yeah. Those two things are different. So, you know, in your private life, you should try to be as good a person as you can, whatever that, that means for you. But it would be silly to think that just by being a good person, you are going to stop the $900 billion of um, fossil fuel projects that the companies are going to, to open up. And, you know, like... It's also important to, 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 to recognise that... Um, Sometimes people who are not morally pure can be involved in political projects that make a real difference, right? So if we do get a mass climate movement in this country, some of the people who will be attending it probably don't recycle, probably aren't vegan, probably don't ride a bicycle. Um, but that doesn't make, mean that the political action that they're engaged in is ineffectual. So that, that yeah. distinction between yeah. ethics and politics is yeah, important. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful way of thinking about it. I want to turn to history now because I'm a historian. I love talking about history. And this book, I mean, it's a work of polit politics and political commentary, but it's also really a book of history. I mean, each of the essays is kind of historical in shape, really, I would say. And so I'm curious about kind of why you took that approach. Like, why did it seem important to kind of look back to kind of do this, you know, political analysis? Yes, you, you are... Triggering my, triggering my imposter syndrome for not being, not being a <laughs> well, prophet. Well, tell you about all the footnotes you got wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Um, well, because I think it's really important to challenge the notion that the way we live now is the way yeah. that human beings have always lived. Because the structures of capitalism have been so normalised that it's very easy to think that they are ingrained in the fabric of the universe mm. themselves. Whereas, in fact, you look back 200, 300 years and people had fundamentally different values, lived in fundamentally different ways, and most importantly of all, related to nature in completely different ways. I, I think in the Australian context, most of all, we have the example of the world's oldest continuous, continuous civilization, of indigenous people living on this continent for, gosh, 40, 50, 60,000 years. It keeps getting pushed further and further back and living in a fundamentally different relationship, both with labor and with nature and that is really, really important. Even merely to say that if we didn't, if we, with we being humans, didn't destroy the planet in the, in the way that we've done in the last few hundred years um, in the past, we needn't do so in the future. That there are other alternatives, that the way we live now is actually tremendously recent in the long scope mm -hmm. of human history, and that there are other options available to us. And in a time where there often seems like there's not very much in the way of hope, one of the advantages of history, and you would know this as a proper historian, is that it's a tremendous resource for hope, yeah. because you can look back to different modes of living, different political projects, and think, OK, they did this in the past, possibly we can do this in the future. Yeah, one of my um, favourite historians is an American um, historian called Paul Kramer, and he has this wonderful essay kind of about the, the political purpose of history that he wrote immediately after the election of Donald Trump in, well, in late 2015. And he had a student, a, a postgraduate student, who said, you know, that's it, I'm going to give up history, like it's, you know, history is just pointless and kind of frivolous at this time of great political crisis, and I don't want to be one of those people who did nothing in the 1930s, you know, I'm on the barricades. And this essay was sort of Paul Kramer's attempt to respond to that student and say, no, actually, history is important in times of political crisis. And he's made, he goes on to make a lot of the similar arguments that Jeff's made, 
And he has this one great line saying that historians are the archaeologists of roads not taken. Like we go back and we dig and we find these options, yeah, right. these okay. things that could have been. So I wanted to ask you, you know, what, as well as the First Nations kind of cultures and their example of how to live in greater harmony with nature, what were other kind of roads not taken that you uncovered in the research for this book? So I, I, I spent a few chapters talking about um, the early phases of the Industrial Revolution. And I think they're really interesting because we tend to think of the Industrial Revolution as the precursor to the mess we're in now because of the technological advances that took place at that time. But what I try to show in the book is that what was much more important was that the industrial relation necessitated a fundamentally different relationship um, between human beings and labour, that even within European feudalism, the way that people related to the land, and human beings have always changed nature in order to live. The, the, the name for the way we intersect with nature is labour because we need to change nature in order to feed ourselves, in order to create housing and, 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 and so on. And what happens with the onset of the Industrial Revolution is acclimatising people to the notion that you are going to sell your ability to labour to someone else and they will then set you to work in ways that are completely outside your control. And what's so striking is that the people who are first subjected to this, something that we take for granted, right? We just think that's what work is. You know, you have to, you have to have a job, you have to go to work, you know, you have to sell your labour power to a boss in order to, to, to make a living. But when people are first subjected to this, they find it so fundamentally alien to everything that they hold dear. The, the, the notion that the things that the way that you inter, the, the, the way that you relate with the natural world, the work that you do should be controlled by someone else and should be subjected to the rhythm of capitalist exchange seems to people seems to people profoundly alien, almost evil and um, there's a really, really interesting parallel that you can make between the responses of indigenous people when um, capitalism comes to Australia in 1788 and the responses of um, the British, Scottish and Welsh people who are the first um, workers in, in, in the factories of, of England. And in both cases, very different cultures and in some ways very different societies, but the notion that your labour should be out of your control and in someone else's control, people just see it as almost an existential injury. And I think that's really, really important because one of the claims I try to make in the book is that if we are to reclaim our relationship to nature, we have to reclaim our relationship to labour and take control of how we interact with the natural world. And I would suggest that that is something that would not only... Um, be extraordinarily beneficial for the environment, but would ex be extraordinarily beneficial for us as human beings as well. Yeah, so, you know, this project of ameliorating the climate crisis is actually a broader social justice project which will benefit us all in myriad ways. 100%. No, no, yeah. no, Naomi Klein somewhere has a really good line about this where, I mean, this is much earlier on in the climate crisis where people are still saying, well, maybe climate change isn't happening. And she says, well, you know, OK, what if it's not happening and we take all of these steps that we need to do in order to fix it, which means that we, you know, we... we create um, more public transport and we give people better jobs and we, you know, give public transport and, you know, we do all of these things and it turns out it wasn't real. What a disaster that would be, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we still improve people's lives. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, and I think if people are looking for hope, that is one thing that is hopeful, that in, in some respects we are at this moment now where the tasks before us are really, really clear and they're fundamentally entwined, that it's, 
it's impossible to solve the climate crisis, I think, without addressing these other issues about the way we relate to each other. So we're not only fighting to save the planet, we are fighting to improve the way that we relate to each other as human beings. And, you know, everyone has to dedicate their life to something. There are worse things to dedicate your life to than that, I reckon. Yeah. Well, that brings us nicely to capitalism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you argue pretty, pretty strongly that, you know, we can't get out of our environmental mess while still living in a capitalist economy. Yep. You know, in the conclusion, you say, capitalism will kill the planet, it must be replaced. Now, there's, you know, there's probably, just to play devil's advocate for a minute, there's probably, you know, some people, including in our current government, who would say, yes, of course, climate change is a problem, we need to address it, but we can do that within a capitalist framework. Like, these things are not incompatible. What would be your response to that, that position? Yeah, in fact, um, I mean, that is literally what they do say. People well, yeah. probably saw um, Tanya Plibersek's response to the um, extinction crisis a few weeks back where she said that, look, the way we're going to um, save biodiversity in Australia is we're going to create a uh, green Wall Street. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to marketise biodiversity. We're going to create a free market that allows people to trade biodiversity credits and this will be the way that extinctions in Australia will be halted. You know, now, you might think that sounds totally crazy. I'm not sure that there are that many people who, who when they try to think of an institution they could trust with, you know, the salvation of the planet, think, yes, Wall Street, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Trustworthy bunch, those. But, 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 but that notion that, um, that, that markets are fundamental, that in some respect markets are more natural than nature itself, and if nature and markets are clashing, then nature has to be adjusted to become more compatible with markets, is 100% hegemonic in the um, international response to climate change. That's the whole logic of emissions trading, for instance, mm. to create an artificial commodity which will uh, facilitate a market which will then um, ameliorate the climate crisis. It's the same, um, it's the same logic that um, governs the, um, the, the, the river here, the Murray-Darling um, River project with, with equally disastrous um, Results And the problem with all of this, well, the problems are, are, are manifold. Partly that the logic of a market is fundamentally different to the logic of an ecosystem. Hmm. A market is something that is measured numerically, it is abstract, it is internationally, it is, it is international. A... Ecosystem is something that's specific, it's concrete, it's local. The process of mapping one onto another is tremendously difficult to do. It's invariably open to all kinds of fraud and um, straight-out dishonesty. But more fundamentally, it changes the entire logic of that natural environment in a way that's completely incompatible with the way it's functioned in the past. To put it at, at, at the crudest level, um, capitalism is a system of blind expansion. Mm. If the capitalist economy, if GDP does not grow each and every year at 3, 4, 5%, then the entire society lapses into a recession and thus a profound social crisis. Natural ecosystems do not work according to that logic. And to me, it just seems insane to think that you can have a market system that will blindly expand year after year with the logic of a cancer cell just growing and growing and growing without there being an ecological disaster. I've yet to find anyone who can explain to me how they think that this is going to work. So that, to me, just seems to me like it's just obvious. It's not going to work. If, if, you know, if the crisis doesn't come next year, it'll come the year after that or the year after that. We simply cannot go on like this. And so, you know, if, if we accept that capitalism needs to go, I mean, 
what comes next? I know there are many, you know, yep. feminist thinkers, ecological thinkers kind of theorising a post-capitalist economics. Do you kind of have a particular model that you think would work or appeals? Yeah, so in, 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 the, in, in the book, I, um, I, I talk about this paper that a bunch of um, economists from the IMF wrote where they um, used this market logic to try to put forward a proposal to save the whales. Right? They basically said whales play a ro an important role in the world ecology. We need to save them. How are we going to do that? We need to put a value on them. So they actually worked out a calculation of how much each whale was worth, you know, according to tourism and all these other things. And you know, somewhere in the book, there is a concrete figure exactly how much is a whale's worth. And they I think get it was a, four million dollars. Four million dollars for each whale. And they're going to create this market system that is going to save the whales. Now, you and I only have to think about this. What would happen if we found a whale that had somehow beached itself, you know, on the on the um, on the, the shores of the ocean somewhere? We would not need a market system to save it. We would simply collectively push it back into the ocean. What these market systems are doing are attempting to find an incredibly complicated and Byzantine way to do the things that we already know how to do. There's no mystery about stopping carbon emissions. We know what, have to, what we have to do. We have the science. We have the technology. The problem is it's not compatible with the logic of continuous blind economic growth. So it seems to me what we need to do is we need a planned economy. We need to collectively decide how we want to labour, what to what ends we want to labour, where we want to allocate our resources and to what ends, and then we need to do it. In the book, I try to uh, put forward some suggestions of what that might look like. For instance, I use the example of Britain in the Second World War. Within the space of five years, Britain went from a peacetime economy to a planned world um, war economy. All through, I mean, no one ever talks about this, but it's true. You could look it up. All the way through the Second World War, the British economy was almost totally planned. The, it was a centrally directed economy where the government simply said, we need to build this many Spitfires, this many tanks, and that's what they did. Now, the reason why that succeeded is because there was tremendous popular support for it, and so there was a degree of um, democratic functioning within the, the, the factories that, that enabled this um, plan system to kind of work. And, and, and that's the model that I try to put forward. You can't have a system of planning without a system um, of democracy, and we need to build on the democracy that we have and extend it so that it it isn't simply a question of political control, but it's also a question of economic control. And again, it just boggles my mind when people say that this is impossible. The, the, the notion that we cannot collectively decide what we want to produce and how we want to produce just seems to me absolutely crazy. Until several hundred years ago, this was simply taken for granted, that the decisions about um, what things were produced were made by human beings. The notion that they have to be controlled by blind markets is something that's remarkably new, and it's failing. It's manifestly failing, so let's not do that anymore. I, I can <laughs> so, I buy into that. Um, and, I mean, that's, again, you know, like using history to show what is possible by looking to the example of World War II to show that, you know, yeah. we've planned the economy before, we can do it again. Um, as well as, I suppose, a kind of an argument for the power of history, I think this book is also a kind of argument for the important role of the imagination and storytelling. In your conclusion, you say, if we can't imagine a better society, we can't protest injustice. Um, and that reminds me of Rebecca Solnit's work, particularly her 2004 book, Hope in the Dark, where she says, stories trap us, stories free us, we live and die by stories, which means that, in, in her words, the change that counts in revolution takes place first in the imagination. Um, so I'm interested in your kind of broader reflections on this question of storytelling. Like, to what extent does it play a role in the fight for a better world? Gosh, that is, that is a really hard question and one about which I have kind of um, conflicting feelings. I think it's really important at events like this that writers not over-egg uh, 
their own importance because it's an occupational hazard. You know, yeah. writers like to think, oh, I've written something down, therefore the world is going to change. Actually, things don't... Actually, you know, most books have almost zero political impact of any kind. But I, 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 I mean, I take your point and I take Solnit's point as well. I think it is paralysing at the moment that so few people have any sense that mm. any other alternative is possible. If no other alternative is possible, then of course you are just going to kind of bunker down and try to get through the horrors that are coming as, um, as best you can. Partly, one thing I would stress, of course, is our rulers don't think that no other alternatives are possible. So uh, I was just talking to Eve about this before. I've just been writing a piece about um, uh, for The Guardian about um, the anti-protest legislation that's been put in place all around the world. I mean, you've probably seen it um, across Australia that increasingly this, most of the states now have um, legislation that makes the kind of activity that was central to most of the environmental campaigns in the past is now punishable by, for, um, by long jail terms. But this is part of a worldwide trend. Um, the next COP meeting is happening in Egypt. Egypt is currently simultaneously proclaiming itself to be a champion of climate change action, even it is, as it is increasingly arresting climate change um, activists. All across America, there are new laws that um, extend the legislation that was put in place after 9-11, but apply it to um, defend fossil fuel um, projects. And the reason why I mention this is the reason governments are doing this is because they know that as the climate emergency intensifies, there will be protests. They know that the injustices are going to be so stark that the effects of climate change are overwhelmingly visited on the poor and the oppressed, and people are not going to take it without fighting back. And so in response to that, they are ramping up the um, machinery of repression. And that suggests to me that they expect there to be a significant confrontation. Um, you know, as I said, $900 um, billion uh, in revenue invested in uh, fossil fuel projects. Um, in the last year, uh, government subsidised fossil fuel um, energy to the tune of, in the last 12 months, I think it was $700 billion. So there's an immense amount at stake in keeping this process going. People are making huge amounts of money in the destruction of the planet, and it's clear things are going to come to a head. And to, <laughs> to your question, that to me is, is, is a kind of source of hope. People are not going to mm. take this. People are going to fight back. The question is, what are they going to be fighting back for? And so the extent to which we can try to offer some concrete alternatives so that we can channel that resistance in a positive direction, I think that is an important project. I'm not under any illusions that, you know, that my stupid book is going to do is going to do that in and of itself, but I think it's a conversation that we yeah, start, need to start a, to have. Culture's yeah, culture's an incremental process. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, Joanna Macy is another thinker who's written about this. You know, she sort of says we're stuck between two stories about the climate emergency. You know, one is everything's fine, business as usual, let's just keep going. And the other one is, you know, we're all screwed, and there's no hope, and, like, let's yeah. just give up now and, you know, enjoy, <laughs> you know play violins on the, on the deck of the sinking, yep. sinking Titanic. And so her diagnosis is we need a third story. Yep. And I think, you know, books, books like this that turn to history and show, you know, the roads not taken do provide kind of other stories, other routes forward. Strong argument for history running through this. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, why would you think that would happen? Um, I want to sort of, as, as we come to a close, um, because we're going to go to audience questions in a minute, so start thinking of those. As we sort of start wrapping up, I want to kind of, I suppose, turn back to that question of, you know, what, what can individuals do? I mean, we started by saying, you know, recycling isn't going to save us, reducing our individual carbon footprint isn't going to save us, but there is obviously room for human agency here. So what, what do you recommend people who are concerned about this do? Yeah, so if I could offer three suggestions, they would be organise, organise and organise, that 
it's manifest, right, that there are no individual solutions to the massive structural problems that we face, so any kind of response needs to be a collective one. And I think that that's important, not just in terms of um, achieving outcomes, that if you join a trade union, if you join a community group, if you join a protest march, if you join one of the student strikes, we're more likely to achieve results. But I think it's also important personally that as soon as you're part of some kind of collective activity, you don't feel so alone. You don't feel so helpless and you don't feel that there is nothing that you can do. You draw a sucker from the people around you and they draw a sucker from you. And there are other consequences as well. As soon as you start to organise, you realise that you need to involve other people. So there are corollaries of that. You know, If we need to involve other people, that means we need to learn how to persuade other people. So we can start practising techniques to argue, te techniques to persuade people, which I think is something that progressives over the last decade have become very bad at, there is a tendency to either assume that everyone agrees with you or if they don't agree with you, just to cut them dead. Now, I'm not suggesting that there's any point trying to, you know, argue with the head of a fossil fuel company, but if you're working alongside someone and they're not persuaded that climate change is real, perhaps you can convince them. Perhaps we can learn how to make those arguments, how to start with where people are at and persuade people. And Again, that is a useful thing to do politically, but it also is something that um, can make you feel better about the climate as well. Because the, the moment that you feel that, OK, I've brought someone along with me, there used to be two of us standing here, and now there are three, and the day after that there'll be four, you start to feel not as hopeless and that perhaps the changes can be made. Now, all of these things are small beer, right, in the scale of, um, of, 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 of what's, happen what's happening. But... I also think we can be confident that the future is going to throw up all sorts of unexpected conjunctions. I mean, think about the last few years and all of the things that have happened to us. You know, think about the COVID outbreak and how much that overturned our lives and how much that changed um, political possibilities. I mean, bloody Scott Morrison introduced the most significant reform of... Um, of social security with JobKeeper. Who predicted that? So things will change, possibilities will happen, and if we are able to organise, um, we'll be in a much better position to push them in a, um, in a good direction. And if we don't do that, then we should be conscious that there are other forces out there who will take advantage. And um, you know, I, I, one of my real concerns, I think, is uh, um, the climate crisis could very easily be a, ma a massive kind of breakthrough for the far right. It's another reason why it's really important for us to organise. Thank you. Uh, we might turn to audience questions now. I think we've got a roving mic. Does anyone have any questions for Jeff? Oh, yeah, there's a question. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jill Sandbrook. Um, just the question on the food chain. You didn't mention food and the production of food. And also, um, I felt you were sort of disempowering the individual slightly, like talking about the recycling, but um, relating that to how the people, and their choices of food, how they can influence the production and corporations and et cetera, if they get on board? Um, I'm, not, what, what, I'm not quite sure what... Uh, yeah, can you just rephrase? Oh, sorry. Um, you didn't mention anything about the food chain no. just now, which is maybe in your book, um, but it's very closely related to nature. Yep. Um, that's probably one question, and I didn't ask this other one, but how do you connect with nature? Because it's in your title of book. Yeah, I mean, the question about um, food production, I guess, is fundamentally entwined with some of the processes that we're talking about, because, of course, um, agriculture on our planet now is capitalist agriculture, and it's driven by all of the injunctions that are... all of the um, imperatives that apply to any other industry, which means that food production has become increasingly destructive. 
So, you know, that processes that were sustainable over thousands of years have been transformed into processes that are incredibly um, destructive. Um, in, in terms of individuals and their relationship to, 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 to food production, I mean, I don't want to be dismissive and I don't want to sneer at people. I'm not suggesting it's a bad thing to grow your own food or, um, you know, to, to, to recycle your food if you can find a, a, a way to do it. As I said, it's a good thing to live an ethical life and it's, it, 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 it's, a, it, it's a good thing to um, take ethical actions. My argument is only that that becomes problematic if we see that as a political solution because I don't think it is. I don't think there's anything that we as individuals can do with the food chain that is going to solve the, the, the scale of the problems that we face. And then the second half of the question about how you connect with nature. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I'm not very interesting in terms of anything. I mean, I like bushwalking and so forth, I mean, and stuff. I mean, but there's nothing particularly <laughs> interesting about that. I think there was another question down here. Yeah. Hi, thanks for this. I love the idea of moving to a planned economy, but I don't know how we can do it, and it is a risk of feeling paralysed as an individual. I do wonder about consumerism, and perhaps that's a massive issue, that the culture of consumerism in Australia and elsewhere, and maybe that is an area where um, we can uh, try and take individual action and also try and push politicians and companies to do better. And I'm wondering if you've talked about that in your book at all. Funnily enough, I, um, I do talk about that at, at, um, at, at, at quite some length because it's a really interesting illustration of some of these points. So the, the, the key moments for the creation of um, the modern consumer culture is the immediate post-war period where, in America in particular, the um, industrialists and politicians are terrified that after the Second World War, the American economy is going to fall into a slump without um, wartime production. And so there is a conscious attempt to increase consumer consumption in America. And there's a whole series of deliberate strategies that are introduced from planned obsolescence. So this is the period in which all sorts of Household objects are designed to fail at a certain time so that um, you will need to buy another one from psychological obsolescence, so marketing campaigns to make you feel that you are out of touch if you don't buy a new car uh, each, year, um, each year. But what's really, really fascinating about this period, and, and this is the era in which plastics and disposable um, packaging are all introduced, is that all of these innovations are face massive initial opposition, which is completely written out of the history now. We, like, we are told that the reason why, you know, that we have all of this disposal packaging is that consumers want it. Actually, almost all of these things, when they're introduced, consumers hated it. There's a, a really fascinating story about the introduction of um, plastic bags in um, supermarkets. Con consumers revolted at the idea because, of course, they were accustomed to bringing in their own bags and, you know, like filling their, their, their hessian sacks up and taking them home. And all of a sudden they were told, that's not what we're doing. Here is a plastic bag. For a while, people were washing their plastic bags and hanging them out on the line <laughs> until, again, there was a massive campaign from the plastics industry to tell people that was silly and foolish and, in fact, you had to throw out your plastic bags. So... It's, so, in part, the, the consumer culture was consciously created by marketing campaigns, but perhaps more importantly, it was normalised by the destruction of the practices that had existed beforehand. So, you know, previously people had gone to the supermarkets and they'd brought in, you know, bags and they'd filled them up with coffee beans or whatever. Increasingly, as everything became covered with disposable packaging, it was no longer possible to do that. And everyone knows the situation now. If you want to recycle bags, it is much, much harder than if you just want to buy disposable packaging. If you're trying to avoid plastic packaging, it is almost impossible. This was a deliberate campaign to prevent people from doing the things that they had done for hundreds and hundreds of years and then blaming them for being responsible for the um, pollution that ensued. That is perhaps not the most articulate explanation of it. Um, it's better in the book. 
Well, you know, consumers <laughs> were made, they can be unmade. <laughs> um, is there another question? Yep. Hi. Um, to do with capitalism and that and massive industries and all the rest of it, uh, which is quite correct, they are destroying our planet. Because now there is, it's illegal to protest, how do we as a general population get the message across to government and industry to say enough? So, so the question is, how, how do we fight back, basically? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's a um, really interesting and also difficult question. And to be honest, if I knew the answer to it, I would be doing it <laughs> and not, not talking about it um, here. So I, I, I don't think there's any simple um, one size fits all strategy, you know, like, and I think actually if you look at the history of the climate movement over the last few years, what you see is a series of experimentations that there are a variety of different tactics that are used that seem to have certain degree of possibilities and then come to a, then, then at some point come to an end. So for instance, there's the climate strike, um, you know, there's Extinction Rebellion, there's the blockade people um, at the moment, and all of these different strategies have a certain amount of cut through and then um, the powers that be find a way of countering them. In the book, I talk at length about the power of collective organising and the need in particular to harness uh, the power that we have in the workplace. Now, again, there's no simple way to do that. The union movement in Australia has never been weaker than it has at the moment. But um, the entire system cannot function unless we continue to do the work that um, they need us to do. And so that at least potentially gives us tremendous power, that if we withdraw our labour, the entire system shuts down. And I think there is potential um, in that. That's not, I know that's not a satisfactory answer to, 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 to your question, um, but that's the best I can do. I think there's another question here. Hi. So I can't remember who, who said this, but Sorry, before I go to my question, thanks for your uh, talk, your presentation, and the conversation earlier. I can't remember who said this exactly, but uh, the, I'm trying to summarize what they said. Um, the future fascists or the future generations of fascists won't need gas chambers when the planet itself becomes a furnace. And you mentioned how uh, energy companies are essentially doubling down on you know, the last couple of decades b before um, all these limits are imposed to maximize their profits and so forth. And that sounds to me some sort of uh, a corporate um, accelerationism in parallel with uh, a political accelerationism coming from the alt-right or the new right emerging with, with Trump and all the different elements are trying to um, foment as much as possible the, the crisis to speed it up in order to produce this chaos that they will step into and take advantage of. So um, the, the question then is, having said all that, what do you make of all these different interconnections? If any, do you see any interconnections between the acceleration of uh, you know, culture wars, the acceleration of a new strand of rabid conservatism, an acceleration of the technologies that seem to feed into all of this, into a different flavor of authoritarian invasion of uh, our consciousness even, you know, the, the way it's being, it's warped our minds, and, and how you know, the, the more traditional and the more um, dependable forms of action that, that we had in the past, the trade unions, social movements, seem impotent at the moment, you know, in the face of these acceleration processes. Yeah, look, that's a really interesting point, and there's um, a lot in that. I mean, I, I wrote a little book about the, um, the, the Christchurch massacre, and one of the um, impetus for, for working on that book was the, um, the perpetrator of that 
atrocity explicitly says in his manifesto, I did this because I am a fascist, right? And like, you know, I, I was just flabbergasted at the time that the media were all saying, we have no idea why he did this. And he said, I did this because I am a fascist. But not only did he describe himself as a fascist, he described himself as an eco-fascist. And there's a whole section of his manifesto about uh, climate change and the environment. And it raises the potential for these issues to become a breeding ground for the far right if we cannot offer a positive solution to climate change in, in an environment of extreme despair, in a, in a climate, in, in, a, um, in a moment where everyone just accepts that the future is going to be worse than the present and the planet is just going to gradually fall apart. You can see how this is really um, ideal circumstances for, for the far right to organise and to offer nihilistic and violent solutions to, to the problems that we face. I mean, one of the things that I think about over and over again is, like, whenever you read any of the IPCC reports, one of the um, predictions that they make about the near future of climate change is that we are going to see huge numbers of people displaced by natural disasters. In Pakistan, 30 million people are currently displaced by the, the floods there. Well, when the climate refugees come to Australia, what political response will we see? It's not hard to imagine a right-wing response to that, which is all about closing the borders and opening up the camps and saying, um, yes, climate change is real. We need to protect Australia from all these climate change refugees. And you can see how climate change could actually become a really important kind of facet in the move to the far right. And on the culture war stuff, I mean, look, I, I think that that's just a real issue that all of us have to address. I mean, it's been an extraordinary um, past few weeks that, you know, that all of our um, politicians um, cancelled parliament for, for two weeks because the death of the Queen. It's incomp it, no one could imagine our politicians doing that because of the climate crisis. But, you know, in terms of future generations, which will future generations see as more important, the climate crisis or the death of the Queen? I mean, the answer writes itself, and yet there's still no sense that this unfolding tragedy all around us is taken with the seriousness that it, that it deserves. On that, on that cheerful, note, cheerful note, we might have to wrap up. Um, uh, but Jeff will be outside uh, signing books, so if you have any burning questions, I'm sure you can ask him then. Um, thank you so much for coming along tonight, and thank you for listening to Jeff and for your wonderful questions. And I'm going to hand back over to Anne-Marie to close us out for this evening. Ah, oh, yes, let's please um, put our hands together for Jeff. <laughs> and Eve. Great job. Um, Eve will be back in the moderator's chair tomorrow, actually, in here at 12 o'clock for a panel called Creating Culture Perspectives on Identity and Belonging. Um, they're talking to Children's Laureate Gabrielle Wong, First Nations author Gary Lonesborough, disability advocate Eliza Hull, talking about the importance of representation in children's books and how, they, how, how these authors are, are writing and what's important to them. And on Sunday in here, we get to hear all about Eve. When, <laughs> Finally get to talk about myself more. <laughs> when Matthew Ruby talks to Eve about their memoir, All About Eve. Okay, we'll say that one more time, All About Eve. Uh, so, um, book signing. Yep, so Jeff will be and signing. Our bar is open till 8.30 and the rest of the weekend is a great full program full of more, more incredible conversations and uh, children's program. Hope to see you here. Thank you again, Jeff.